Hey everyone, uh, we're looking to hire a part-time communications manager to join the Epicenter team. You can get more information about that position at epicenter.tv slash apply. So if you're interested in learning more about that, if you have, think you have what it takes, go to that website uh, and uh, you'll find the job description and uh, the instructions on how to apply for our communications manager position. Thanks. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. So a, a lot of you must have heard uh, that there's this... Uh, area of blockchain app technology application which is provenance and tracking things as they move through the supply chain of a particular industry. Today our episode deals with provenance and we are going to talk to Leanne Kemp who is the CEO of Everledger. She's building a startup around the, the provenance tracking of diamonds in the diamond market. So we're going to talk about the diamond industry, how her solution works and how, what kind of benefits very accurate provenance tracking can bring about. So before we start, let's say hi to Leanne. And Leanne, can we have a bit about your background? How did you get interested in the blockchain space? Hi everyone, thanks for having me firstly. Um, how did I get interested in the blockchain space? I guess I've been 25 years in emerging technology, so I've always been interested in technology first and foremost. And blockchain happens to be one of those emerging disciplines that started to rise its head into industry uh, quite some time ago. So it wasn't really about just saying here's blockchain or Bitcoin and this is of interest. I mean, I've always been fascinated with technology. So instead of playing Sudoku on the weekend, you know, I'm tapping away on my keyboard. And uh, so what were you doing prior to, uh, to working at Everledger or having founded Everledger? Well, I guess I've only just learned that I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've always had my own businesses and that spanned, as I said, 25 years. So you could probably guess my age now. Um, you know, the company before uh, I started Everledger, um, which we only began last year, was actually in the um, jewelry and insurance space. And the company before that um, was in, you know, large demographic data in, um, you know, survey information. So... We could, we could start with uh, uh, talking about the diamond industry. So most of our, our listeners are generally interested in blockchains and many of them might not have ever encountered the diamond industry. Personally, I have very little experience of it. So we could start off with uh, uh, some questions about that industry itself. So can you, can you tell us like as a broad overview, how, how the supply chain works? Like where are diamonds produced? What, what happens in the middle from production? Uh, and finally, to the distribution to the end consumer. Give us a brief overview of, of the supply chain. So I guess most people really have an affinity with diamonds when it comes to a special life event. So whether that be a marriage or a proposal or even the birth of a child as a gift. The diamond industry, you know, it's about 130 years old. So it boasts some pretty impressive track history. And the industry is often thought of in two segments. The first segment is the rough segment of diamonds, so where they are mined and as they come out of the ground in a crystalline form. And then it goes through one iterative manufacturing step where the diamond becomes cut and polished uh, and ends up as a polished stone, which, of course, most of us would be uh, associated with or if not wearing inside of a piece of jewellery. Um, you know, the industry boasts some pretty impressive numbers. Uh, rough diamonds come out of the ground at around $15 billion annually. And by the time that one diamond in its form hits the cutting and polishing sector of the supply chain, it transforms to about a $47 billion market. And after it's cut, and by the time it hits the retail network, not set in a ring, it's around $80 billion, about $75 billion. And that's an annual throughput. So, um, you know, there's some pretty interesting numbers involved. The size of the jewellery market itself at a retail level, that boasts around $300 billion, And that's set with inside of jewellery. So, of course, you're adding on, you know, components of gold and even other gemstones to complement that value. 
So in, in this supply chain, where are the are, are there any uh, areas in the chain where where uh, monopolies are concentrated? Uh, where where is the competition? How do, how how do those dynamics work? So I mean, monopolies by its definition is one player, and our industry doesn't have just one player. <laughs> um, you know, when you think about um, two things, firstly. The volume of the world's diamonds are mostly mined in Africa, but we also are seeing predominant forcing of mining coming out of uh, uh, Russia and um, and Canada and, of course, Australia for mostly the fancy cuts or the pinks themselves. Um, you know, when we talk about monopolies, as I said, one player, but that's not necessarily the space. The dominance in our industry, of course, and substantially so, you know, De Beers was one of the first originators or the grandfather of the industry and they still of course, proudly support the backbone today. We see uh, a dominant player in Russia being a co-owned state force uh, called Al Rosa. And then you have a number of other dominant mining companies, Dominion, you know, out of Canada is another example. Um, you know, in the middle part of the pipeline itself, these are where we cut and polish. Whilst we've had uh, technology assist in that, it is largely still an art form. So we often see generations of family businesses that have been born into the industry and have a love or an association for the art form of cutting diamonds. And we often see these are generational families uh, in, in, in areas such as Brussels and Antwerp and, and India predominantly today uh, is probably the largest de um, you know, demographic or geographical sort of presence of the cutting section. And then in, in America, New York, you know, we have still have a love of luxury in New York and there's no doubt about it. Uh, a lot of the, you know, major diamond uh, wholesalers and retailers are really situated inside of New York as well and that's not, you know, that's not dissipating backwards. But emerging countries are playing some significant roles. Um, you know, Venezuela have a rich seam of kimberlite, which is, of course, where diamonds are formed out of the crust of the earth. Um, and, but, you know, more recently they have not been involved in the Kimberley process. So, you know, the trading of diamonds is somewhat, you know, challenged out of that country, even though they hold a very rich scene of Mother's Earth's assets. Um, so you would probably see that the dominant player is still Africa, Botswana, and, of course, they, you know, created Debswana, which was the joint venture between uh, Botswana government and De Beers. So you mentioned the, the Kimberley process. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, sure. So... You know, the Kimberley process, it actually began in the year 2000 when the United Nations came together and decided to make a landmark decision that any diamonds that were traded or had come from a conflict zone needed to be ceased. Um, and so in 2003, uh, they formed a three-step verification process and around um, 80 countries around the globe came together. And this represented about 99% of all diamond trading countries they came together to form the Kimberley process, which sometimes I joke about it is like a Boy Scout promise that the world came together and said, no, no longer, no longer will we accept uh, diamonds that haven't had any disclosure of origin. Um, and these countries and or this consortium, you should probably say, has come together as both a government and an industry initiative. Um, and there are frameworks that are in place to ensure certain protocols and standards are met when diamonds are exported from one country and imported into another country. So it declares not only the country of origin of the goods, but also the HS codes, so the harmonised sequencing codes around the goods that are physically being traded. And this declaration, you know, over the process of seven years since it was created, was largely successful. You know, over 25% of the conflict stones were reduced and today, less than 1% of diamonds traded across the globe um, are from conflict areas. So if there was to be a guiding light and an example of how pseudo-government and industry could come together and how they could form a change step for the better in terms of ethical trade, that would be a guiding light. But in terms of technology, each of these offices are you know, armed with no more than a fax machine and, a, and an embossing stamp. Largely, the certifications are still pay, based on paper-based processes. Um, you know, there are physical filing cabinets in some of these offices around the globe that uh, that hold the, the certifications. And what we've seen, you know, albeit 
not prolif not a prolification of fraud, but we have seen instances of it where, um, you know, and more recently there was actually an example from Sierra Leone to Hong Kong where a document, a Kimberley certificate, was fraudulently connected to a set of parcel uh, rough diamonds being traded. And it was, you know, luckily the, the line of sight or the trained eye picked this up, but there was very, there's very little systems in place to enable the cross-checking, you know, of these certifications um, well beyond the border. So, I mean, border control steps in, but uh, certainly well beyond the border, there's very little visibility around the provenance. So, I mean, uh, I, guess the, I guess the fundamental problem of uh, knowing where a diamond comes from, the way, the way I tend to think of it is, it, it should involve like two aspects of it, right? Can, can, for example, one aspect is, can a diamond be uniquely identified while it's flowing through a supply chain, right? Like, are there like numbers to each diamond? And then uh, the, the second question would be, um, how, how does the documentation for something like a Kimberley process work? How, how do I know that this particular diamond with, this, uh, with, with these characteristics that I'm trying to buy is guaranteed not to originate from a conflict area? So as I spoke about the different elements of industry, they actually command different disciplines of detection and different disciplines of identification. And thankfully, the diamond industry is relatively has a relative controlled environment, and there's already been layers of different types of technology that have been accepted by industry and machines that enable us to machine grade the color of certain diamonds, or even be able to 3D um, extract the digital points of the diamond. So rough diamonds are typically traded in parcels of stones, and so. It's more about tracking the container of those stones as they pass through the pipeline rather than the individual stones themselves. Um, but once a diamond really goes through a cutting process, it then becomes individualized and a second set of certification is applied, which is really at the point where diamonds attain their value and their, and their digital points. So to be able to identify a polished stone um, you know, we were able to provide a digital incarnation of that stone, like a thumbprint. Um, but it doesn't just end at the thumbprint or the dimensions of the stone or the serial number that is engraved on the girdle or the crown of the stone. You need to be able to go a little bit further. You need to be able to use high definition photographs to be able to take the view from the top down of the stone. And so just like, you know, I liken I liken the same evolution of the technology that the police have applied to identifying criminals um, to how we are evolving in terms of our identification of diamonds. So if you were to think about yourself as a criminal in the 80s, the likelihood is that you probably got away with your crime. Um, the only real way that they were able to detect you was probably by your thumbprint. But as facial recognition has become... Uh, a little bit more advanced and even DNA hair follicles um, or mouth swab testing has become more advanced. So too are these similar disciplines being applied in, in our industry or in, even in other industries, for example, you know, coloured stones or and, and even in fabrics in, in luxury goods. So the very first iteration of what we did was we took 40 metadata points of the diamond as well as the serial number that was engraved on the girdle of the, the stone and looked no different to what has happened or what's existing in the market now for motor vehicles. So if a motor vehicle is stolen, there is a, a, a license plate registry that you're able to check if a car was stolen or involved in a write-off accident or was a victim of theft or crime. And if you were to buy that second-hand car, you could see the history of that car. You could see, even if they were well-kept service records, you could see this. But there's no such registry available in the diamond industry. So once we were able to establish the identity of the diamond and really start around the certification process, both at rough and then again at polished, it gives us, it gives us a really good baseline to be able to then grow those certification layers further into provenance or the chain of custody. So the rough diamonds are a little bit different. Um, you know, rough diamonds themselves can't necessarily be easily or uniquely identified and the industry itself doesn't uniquely identify rough diamonds whilst it trades in parcels. Um, it often looks at fungibility. So a parcel of stone might sit in a certain type of colour grading. Um, but it's a really important step to be able to master, which is the work that we've been doing more recently in the last number of months, 
The first 12 months of our organization was focused on polished stones. The last eight months of our organization was focused in rough diamonds and the Kimberley certification. And now we're actually heavily focused on the change step when the rough diamond transforms into the polished stones. So I liken that to being a parentage. So just like I would give birth to my children, I have the ability at that point in time to have a birth certificate of the children that have come from my DNA. And this is the work that we're doing right as we speak right now. This is our Christmas present to ourselves, to challenge ourselves on how we can provide that parentage tracking at the time the transformation happens from rough to polished. So um, prior to doing this episode, I was I was trying to look at um, kind of what kinds, kinds of certifications are already there for diamonds. And I, and I came across uh, GIA certification and SGA certification. And perhaps our listeners could just search GIA certificate and see how, how they look like. But like, I could see that the diamond industry already has these uh, certification mechanisms where each, the characteristics of each diamond, uh, so uh, probably the diamond can be physically sent to a certification agency and that agency would kind of write down all the characteristics of it and give it a unique number. Now, uh, doesn't, why doesn't this certification process itself have provenance data? Like, why hasn't this already happened? You know, that's a good question. I'm not sure why there hasn't been a natural evolution to this, but it's very clear that the industry at large is, you know, focused on on chain of custody and certification today um, and the ability to extend it for provenance. Um, you know, why hasn't it happened before today? I mean, it is a good question. I guess, you know, why didn't Facebook and why wasn't social media a platform before it started? I guess it's one of those moments that it's a natural evolution in, in technology and in an understanding of ethical supply chain. You know, one thing that is happening in the diamond industry is the onset of synthetic stones. And, you know, synthetic stones were created by GE for most industrial purpose grades, so drill bits and saw blades and what have you. But in the last sort of number of years, we've really seen an onset of venture capital money and we've seen new disciplines or even the robust disciplines of high pressure and high temperature um, or CVD enabling us to make synthetic stones at gem quality standards. And so more so than ever now, I think it's an important time to be able to ensure the provenance of stones, you know, well beyond the work that was done in the year 2000 with the Kimberley process around ethical stance. I think it's ensuring that we have a real disclosure around where the stones have come from, but also that the stone is from a genuine source in terms of coming from a mine or a natural resource rather than being a synthetic nature. Um, you know, I'm just glad that the technology is able to afford a platform to provide uh, a solution to some of these problems or even to be able to quench the, threat, the thirst that the industry has to providing provenance. Let's take a short break to talk about JAX. JAX is a multi-coin wallet created by the people at Decentral. Now in the past, if you had a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies, it was a pain to handle them. You either had to leave them on an exchange, which was insecure, or you had to have all these different wallets, which was a hassle. Fortunately, now with JAX, those medieval days of darkness, misery, and suffering are over. JAX supports multiple cryptocurrencies and new ones are being added. But it's not just storing cryptocurrencies you can do with JAX, but you can also exchange them directly from within inside the wallet thanks to their Shapeshift integration. And since there's only one seed, JAX makes it super easy to back up and sync to your other devices. JAX works with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and has browser extensions for Firefox and Chrome. So go to JAX.io, that's J-A-X-X.io, to download the wallet and get started today. We'd like to thank Jax for the support of Epicenter. So you mentioned earlier uh, a case where some certification documents, uh, so, so Kimberly process uh, certification documents had been forged in a trade. Um, is this something that happens a lot in the industry? Uh, you know, the forging of certified documents um, when, when, when this process is meant to you know, uh, eliminate this kind of fraud? So the quick answer to that is no. I mean, there are participants that have been in industry and they're generational, you know, the generational businesses or they're, of course, you know, heavily regulated internally with best practice. 
Um, you know, so the industry participants that are well known in industry, most definitely not. In fact, the industry as a whole moves as a pretty big force to ensure that we stamp out fraud. But of course, there are, you know, anarchic forces that run on the outside streams that recognize that we're talking about diamonds, you know, diamonds is a vehicle of value. You know, it's often become a vehicle for anti-money laundering and terrorist funded activities. And we see elements of those that aren't trusted within industry that are taking advantage, you know, of the poor paper processes or the poor technology that's currently afforded to industry. But I wouldn't say that it is large. I wouldn't say that it is something that we see on a daily basis. But when it does occur, it is material because we are dealing with a high value item and we are dealing with an item that is small in size, easily obscured in terms of transport and can be traded across borders without identity. And so, you know, when you start thinking about what industry does with banks and insurance companies, they often look at KYC. So they know the customer and whether that customer be a corporation or an insurance center could be me as a person. But they don't look at the object, the KYO, and this is really the layer that we've been bringing to the market. So, you know, it's the diamond that's the vehicle of the fraud or the diamond that's the vehicle of the anti-money laundering. And I'm just purely, if I thought about me, I've stolen a car, as an example, um, you know, what they're doing is they're checking the fuel pump station, um, just to be sure that the, the when the car stops to check with fuel, they're not even checking the number plate of the car, they're just checking that, you know, the person who was traded uh, is actually got a legitimate source of money. Um, but, you know, we're kind of missing that that bit, the KYO, so the object level itself. That's really fascinating. Uh, I mean, I, I like that you talk about KYC, because this is a I guess it's it's hard to see the similarities there, but KYC the, the, and the problems there are very similar to the problems that you're addressing with uh, with diamonds is how to prove the providence of identity documents, for instance, that uh, allow for an individual to say, you know, I am who I say I am. And I think that a lot of those, a lot of, of the complexities of trying to prove um, some that so in KYC, for instance, a lot of the complexities around that process are uh, are inherent to a system that is paper based, um, and and the the entire K KYC process is just verifying that all of these documents that I provide to my bank when I open a bank account or that I provide to my telco or whatever are actual documents, and that the documents that I'm presenting are are my identity documents. So. In a sense, I, I'd like you to talk about how, you know, how blockchains uh, and specifically the technology that you've developed uh, addresses this by dematerializing um, the process. Um, I, I, I'd like to extend that uh, just by saying that I, I personally think that although blockchains have a, a, a number of great advantages, uh, specifically in traceability and providence, etc., one of the things that often gets overlooked is the fact that by implementing a system like this that provides all of these properties to establish provenance and traceability, we're also onboarding dematerialization. So I think a lot of industries are going to onboard blockchains as a means to provide more transparency, et cetera. At the same time, they're dematerializing a lot of processes that are still based on paper. Yeah, sure. I guess a couple of things. Um, you know, one kind of comment around KYC and KYO, when you, you know, when you're embarking on an emerging technology like blockchain that's super nascent, that potentially is misunderstood, and as a startup, you have a certain runway or a certain time to market. I mean, I think it's important to understand the frictional points of being able to have industry adopt. And, you know, that often runs through an education process. And then when you talk about a financial backbone, you know, as Bitcoin and blockchain was really first touted in terms of payment services, there's a whole overlay of regulation and even more dangerously privacy. And so when, 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 I, when we kind of face some of this, you know, diamonds as an object have no rights. <laughs> you know, the diamond itself can't turn around and say, you have to protect my privacy because I'm an, it's an object. So, um, you know, this has enabled us to be able to really hone in on, you know, the very material points and being able to say, what is the problem that we're trying to address? And what is the most potent positioning or the potent elements of the technology that we can marry to provide a solution? 
And how do we provide that solution quick enough to come to market, um, be revenue positive as we are, and and actually have real customers within the first year or year and a half of trade? And and that was really the kind of the secret to the success of Everledger in its very first instance. Um, when we talk about sort of dematerializing supply chain or dematerializing, um, you know, industries themselves, I guess, you know, the industry, the diamond industry is super fascinating. When you think about the elements of the technology, you know, this is a network technology. The real power of the technology really comes into play when consortiums are able to work together, particularly trusted node points. Um, and when you think about the diamond industry, the very core of its trading hubs, whether that be the consortium of the Kimberley process, a lot of these disciplines that electronically are translated by the technology of blockchain and smart contracts and Bitcoin already reside in a people sense, in a people community sense, in a consortium sense, in a discipline sense. Um, but it's just that we haven't necessarily had the technology to be able to lay into the industry as we are today. But not only that, the financial services industry sees a promise of this technology, but it's hampered by regulations and it's hampered by all of the talk around privacy of data, and rightfully so. But in our technology, in our industry, we're not unwinding 40 years of financial services legacy. You know, we are not having to go back and unwind the layer upon layer upon layer of technology that's been added to it. We can literally take the industry into the very best of tech today by purely making a change step out of paper. And so, you know, there is um, kind of no greater time to be able to work uh, with uh, such an industry that vows, you know, some pretty impressive numbers from 15 billion in rough trade to 80 billion in retail. That's 500% value that's stacked across the, across the supply chain with one iterative manufacturing step. So this one that you wouldn't find another supply chain like this when you really think about it. You know, textiles, it's got to come from all sorts of extraneous parts of the world, zippers and ties, and you've got to go through about 50 different iterations to be able to make the jumper that you're wearing or the pair of jeans, you know, that uh, that you're wearing uh, on a daily basis. But diamonds go through one iterative step. And so to be able to capture this in such a way, not only does it provide a good baseline for the diamond industry, but also it takes us into other, you know, luxury goods or other things that are actually are of object of uh, conflict trade. So that, that one iterative step is cutting and polishing, right? Am I getting yeah, that right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. I, I, love, I love this concept that uh, you came about, which is like KYO, right? Like It's a knockout punch. <laughs> yeah, it's a knockout punch. That's such an amazing acronym. It's such an amazing acronym. I've never heard of it before. Really? Well, yeah. I talk about it a lot in the insurance industry because, you know, the insurance industry is really being focused on KYC and, and, and look, I'm the best example of a customer for them. You know, I'm an international traveler. I have property in multiple countries. I have a, an amazing diamond, but I also know where to buy the best fake Rolex in the world. But when they are covering my insurance policy, I tick all the boxes, but they don't actually get to the point where they ask me about all of my objects that I'm insuring. You know, they do after the event. So after the crime has happened or after the loss or the theft, and then I need to bring what my proof of ownership was and what my proof of purchase was, but it's too late. So if we're able to bring this in such a way up front, the insurers have more of a peace of mind around what it is that they're insuring and, and more so than now than ever, particularly with synthetic stones or even counterfeit goods, um, you know, so... It is an important, I talk about it all the time in insurance, so. That's interesting because I've been starting to attend some insurance uh, conferences and the, 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 the hype around blockchains uh, at insurance events is usually uh, more related to claims processing or payments processing. I, or perhaps like event, um, uh, like being able to, uh, to track uh, with an with a um, an oracle that uh, you had so, certain meteorological uh, events happen in one place or another, but uh, this idea of KYO had never really occurred to me either that they can uh, ensure an item based on its original provenance and know that the item that they're insuring is in fact uh, you know an authentic uh, diamond or or whatever. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, there's a whole transformation that could occur in the insurance industry with this technology and KYO. And that is, you know, instead of insuring me as the customer first and my objects, actually insuring the object for life. And so you then start to think about the holy grail of insurance. And the holy grail of insurance is multi-generational insurance. So the ability to know that within a family and its set of heirlooms, that that diamond is insured for generations upon generations is a really interesting concept. And, you know, the insurance industry is doing this in some respects with buildings. And so they're insuring the building for the longevity of the building and the provenance of the services works. Um, but to bring it into high value net items is a, is a real transformation step that's occurring now. Today's magic word is diamond. D-I-A-M-O-N-D. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener award. So, so Leanne, uh, in, in, in many of your talks that you give publicly, you, you always uh, have this concept that good provenance data will allow us to build more financial services on, on top of whatever product we're dealing with. So uh, with diamonds, if you have good provenance data, then you might be able to build, you know, uh, ETFs for diamonds, etc. Right. So before we go into themes like that in the towards the end, can we have like just a brief overview of how kind of the diamond supply chain intersects with banking and insurance? Like what are the kinds of products that uh, banking and insurance sector deliver to the diamond supply chain or the people owning diamonds? Yeah, so um, I'll pick on two things. I guess the easy one for me to pick on is the fact that everyone's talking about blockchain and smart contracts playing a substantive role in supply chain finance. And, and, and let's take that as an example in the diamond industry. So, you know, the diamond industry in the middle part of the pipeline where we talk about cutting and polishing, that boasts around $20 billion annually. And there are effectively two brave Western banks that support the space, one being ABN AMRO and the other is Barclays. Um, you know, and there are other banks around the world, whether that be Indus or, you know, uh, Bank Lumi, yeah, Ping An in mainland China. Um, but one of, the, one of the issues in our industry is that for the very first time in around 130 years, you know, the industry is at the mercy of financial services. We saw about eight weeks ago Standard Chartered pulling out of our industry and leaving around a $3 billion short, $2 billion shortfall, sorry, uh, in supply chain finance. You know, most of the banks are currently recording plant and equipment security um, and just enabling them to be able to finance the trade flow of invoicing. And we've recognised and have seen in our industry a number of issues that are causing some concern for in financial institutions. Um, you know, some of them will be that they're double financing the pipeline. Um, there's been, you know, an article that came out in The Economist not so long ago, and most of those issues really came out of India. Um, you know, and then, of course, we have round tripping of diamonds, which is another problem around the pricing and transfer pricing. And so a lot of these problems that are in industry are causing you know, some concerns for banks that are highly regulated, that have to march through the regulations of Basel III. And so when we think about the skyscraper of Everledger that we're building, um, if you are able to identify the object, and we can do that without the friction of getting to market quickly, which is what we achieved relatively fast, and then we can provide digital provenance of certification. So to know that the certification has been issued by an oracle, that it hasn't been tampered with, and that they know where that certificate is trading online. So, you know, most of the inventory inside of the diamond industry, um, whether it be traded online or even in exchanges or bourses, is actually done on the power of the certificate. Um, and to be able to know and understand where those certifications are being used, sold, have been traded, is something that the industry is blind to today. And the technology can afford us the ability to provide digital certification and provide digital provenance of that certification. So we have that complexity layer. But once you have certification as the central backbone, that you know and understand that it's come from an Oracle source, that it hasn't been tampered with, you can extend it into provenance. But more importantly, for banks, you can give the bank the ability to provide collateral management. And so they can take a security over the top of the inventory of 
the diamond dealer or the um, you know or, or of the cutter and the polisher. And so if you think about a retailer, you know the retailer some of the most largest part of the balance sheet for the retailer is holding stock rather than what else is chattels that is left is probably a good coffee machine and a really bad fax machine. So from a banking perspective, the ability to take securitization or the ability to take security or collateral management forward has not been seen in our industry before today. And that's something that we know that we can help with. Um, and that's kind of exciting. <laughs> okay. So what you're essentially saying is, uh, like if if you have some other industry like say, let's say the real estate industry or or some industry like that the the basic unit inside that industry is is like a loan right and financial institution makes a loan to a homeowner but then what the kind of financial services exist on top of it is you have these loans and then you have systems of like packaging these loans creating securities out of these loans and then trading these loans all over the market etc now what now what you're saying is once you have provenance data of diamonds things uh so today when you don't have provenance data of diamonds you really cannot build all of these financial products on top of the on top of diamonds because uh suppose you build a product on top of it and it turns out that the diamond is not a genuine diamond or it is a stolen diamond or it's a blood diamond etc right so whatever you build on top is rests on an unstable foundation because the diamond itself may not be genuine or may, may be stolen. But once you start having good provenance data, then all of these financial institutions can package the inventories of retailers or the diamond ownership of people and create new kinds of financial assets around it. Yeah, and to, and to provide this, you need to be sure that you have a seniority. So the banks must have a right or whoever the financial product service provider is has a right to, you know, like a caveat or a mortgage over the top of that physical asset. And we see this in property. I mean, this is normal in property, but we just haven't applied this uh, in a financial sense to the diamond. Um, but, but why not? So if we can provide the transparency, we have the ability through smart contracts and certification to provide seniority and the legal framework around the recognition of this, um, then you, you know, you're, you're really, you know, you're creating a new future. And we could also add that you could uh, perhaps uh, avoid uh, some of the similar things that happened in 2008. I mean, if we had trace, if we had traceability of the loans uh, in uh, in the housing crisis, you know, perhaps the housing crisis wouldn't have been so uh, so hard. Um, let's, totally agree. Uh, let's move on to yeah. Let's move on to the well. This, I mean, this is something that I, I think also is needed. It's not not only for physical objects, but also for financial objects. We can we can provide traceability there, um, and 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 avoid some of those problems. I mean, like in in reinsurance as well. Not only in the sort of financial sector, but the insurance sector, we can also a, a apply traceability all through the uh, all through the chain. Uh, from the policyholder all the way to the insurer and the reinsurer and perhaps uh, have a system that has better traceability uh, in, in all those layers. So these, 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 these subjects are all very, very uh, connected uh, in the end, whether you're talking about diamonds or whether you're talking about a loan or whether you're talking about KYC, it, 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 it all comes down to basically the same thing. Um, so let, let's move on to, uh, to, uh, to Everledger and the technology stack that you've built and you know, the product that you've built around that. Uh, can you describe um, from, from a technical perspective sort of what Everledger looks like? Like what are you selling to your clients? Yeah, so I mean, we, so where do we start? I guess, you know, in the very first iteration of Everledger, we um, came out of the gate with a hybrid. So we're both on the public Bitcoin blockchain. And then of course we have our private uh, ledger as well, which is permissioned and we break out federated consensus. And most of the consensus modeling is really mirroring the existing frameworks that we see in a people sense or a corporation sense in industry today. And, and, you know, that, that was, that, that for us was actually, you know, an interesting and easy moment for us to be able to work out what the modeling uh, was. We're not necessarily disrupting our industry, actually. We're co-evolving the industry. We're involved in multiple points along the supply chain and we uh, are technology advancement. So we often describe ourselves Intel inside. So Everledger is the Intel inside when it comes to, you know, some of these um, technology leaps forward. 
you know, there's a there's a whole bunch of thinking around where does a public ledger play and what's really the role of a private ledger. And um, I'm not sure that there is any hard and fast answer. Um, and for me, I think some of the discussions that we embark upon in our industry is no different to a religion. And there'll be different reasons why people make the uh, association or the assimilation to certain decisions. Um, but for us, you know, we have to anchor our decisions around what is the problem that we are solving and how are we to be sure that the technology can be consumed by industry in such a way that we're solving those problems rather than creating even more. Um, you know, if, when you also think about consensus and, and how you would form this forward in industry for the benefit of, of everyone, whether that be the public consumers or whether that be government organisations such as the, you know, Department of Imports or, or the Foreign Office here in the UK that handles the, um, you know, the trading of diamonds, we have to be very mindful of how we're approaching the market um, themselves, not only from uh, an architecture perspective, but also a privacy of data and what information can and should be seen by the public eye and what should be seen by the governments. So we actually haven't deterred from our original thinking in terms of public and private and a hybrid model. What we have done is really started to understand as maturity of players have come into the market and they've afforded certain types of tool set, we've become relatively agnostic in terms of any brand or any um, platform that we that we, we work with or choose to work with. Um, it's not necessarily, we're not chanting the religion per se. In fact, if anything, we're relatively agnostic when it comes to, uh, it comes to the association. So we have stayed, you know, relatively close to the original participants of our stack. So Eris, of course, on a smart contract implementation, um, we still peg our records into the Bitcoin blockchain. And more recently, um, you know, we embraced wholly the tool set that was afforded to us by Hyperledger and the high speed security network with IBM and Linux One. Um, you know, most of the work in that sense was ensuring that we had a hyper secured network that could be rolled out to governments around the world uh, to support the Kimberley certification process. And that was the reason why we, you know, chose that integrated stack. What does it look like for us? I mean, our application in the first instance was really delivered through APIs. So everything was just an API layer in the issuing or the consumption of data. And then more recently with our certification platform, we've, you know, growing that out as a web app so that each of the offices uh, or the users of industry have the ability to physically issue, revoke, um, create, co-sign, uh, track the digital provenance um, of the physical certifications themselves. And then, and more recently, um, has really been the interface layer with machine vision. So onboarding of um, high visibility scanning, whether that be in a three-dimensional sense or whether that be in a two-dimensional sense, in terms of the photographs of the diamonds from the crown down, and that that you know that's been um, that's been highly challenging, but it's actually probably been more rewarding than dealing with the blockchain work, to be honest. <laughs> um, so that's been the exciting stuff we've been doing, sort of secretly behind behind the scenes. So I'm curious then. Uh, so you're still using the Bitcoin blockchain uh, as as a public ledger for certification. Yes, we are. So we're issuing the records out um, onto the Bitcoin blockchain. So if you think about, you know, proof of work and proof of stake, it doesn't necessarily give us any confidence around the data that's with inside of the hash. And so hence, we wanted to be sure that we had a private ledger that enabled us to confirm or have the right federated consensus agreement that the data that was being provided inside of our private ledger had the robustness of record, but that the public ledger assured that the record in time was actually proof in time. And so we, hence the reason why we did that from day one. Um, for us, it was it was normal, but for many people came to us and said, oh, wow, that's actually a really interesting way to think about how you would construct this. Um, but for us, it was it was it was day one. I don't I don't know that we would change that. No, I, I, I totally agree. And so we have a similar approach to Stratum where you can have federated, federated consensus of, uh, say, a, a, a 
different steps of a process uh, on a private layer or permissioned layer, and then you can have that be certified on a public blockchain, which provides sort of auditability, external auditability, and record keeping in time. So then, could you explain then how what is what are the what are the uh, interactions within the private network uh, that you've built on Eris. Uh, what do those smart contracts do? And and also, who are the nodes uh, in this network? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, smart contracts really lays into a number of things. Firstly, um, you know, the change of ownership or change of provenance or change of control of an item. Um, so, proof in time that this custody event had occurred and that even though the custody event had occurred, for example, it could be a secure transport layer, um, that it doesn't necessarily mean that the change of ownership has occurred. So who owns the diamond is very different to who has custody of the diamond, which is now even separate to who has seniority rights to the diamond in the event of um, you know, a, a liquidity event or, or an insolvency event. And so the smart contracts are laid in and around some of those events that are relatively linear, actually. They're not that exciting and it's not a very complicated contract. Where we're starting to get something really quite cool, um, which is will come out uh, in Q2, is around layering in, and you were talking about this before with the insurance world, where a lot of insurance companies recognize that the smart contract implementation really comes into its discipline when you have external or parametric data sources that can provide some type of definition of outcome or, or settlement finality. And when you think about the world of diamonds, most of the our world has been constructed around reputation. So, you know, the reputation of experts is such an important part of our industry. Um, I'm an alumni with the GIA, so the Gemological Institute of America, where you can run through an educational series on um, knowing how to grade diamonds or how to classify diamonds. And of course, if you were really that excited about the industry at large, you could become a gemologist. Um, so, you know, to be able to then um, work with the insurance network, often you will have the insurance networks lean upon what they call loss adjusters. And loss adjusters are independent third parties that are often appointed by insurance companies to assist in the validation of claim. And they establish two things. They establish the circumstance of loss. Um, so what was the circumstance upon which this risk occurred, whether it was a theft or whether it was, um, you know, whether it was a lost item or in a PI sense, so a, um, a professional indemnity sense, was it something that that professional person did wrong and how does that then affect the quantum or the claim amount itself? They're two very separate things, but they interact in terms of the settlement of claim. So some of the things we're doing in the diamond industry is looking at where can we bring either machine data that hasn't really been shared before in industry. Most of the data and most of the science that's been involved has been black boxed. And we're in an afforded and privileged situation to be able to work with this data and enable the ability for financial services, so banks and insurance companies, to reduce risk around either the finance of supply chain or in the issuance of insurance. So one really cool, cool part of the industry is where we have that transformative step. When we have a rough diamond, the rough diamonds are often scanned and there's a physical scanning machine that gives you the potential yield of that diamond. Now, if you were Lucara, as an example, Lucara mined, had a massive, massive diamond that came out of the ground, there'd be many ways you could take a 100-carat stone and cut it. You could cut it into a very large diamond, an 80-carat diamond, as an example, would be huge, but it mightn't have the right levels of color and clarity. So the value of that diamond might be substantially large, but it could take a very long time to trade. And so often the industry is faced with these economic decisions around yield. And they are given this uh, extraction of data to be able to make a decision as to how they want to cut their diamonds and whether they want to cut them into a lot of little ones or a large big one or a certain fancy shape. Um, and that machine assists in this. But at the point where it's cut, there is both the art and the discipline of cutting, which often, as I said before, goes into places like Tel Aviv and Antwerp in India, and there are machines that are used, and there is a risk that's associated with the cutting of diamond. And often if a diamond isn't cut correctly, it could shatter, or that it might end up in a catastrophic loss, and there's an insurance cover that covers that. But to yield or to deem how, who was at blame, what is the risk, what is the value, and what is the settlement finality, often resides upon experts in industry. 
and you can count those experts on one hand. Um, the ability now to be able to take the blockchain record as a proof at time before cut, uh, an extraction of the physical scanning machine, overlay all of this into a set of smart contracts that overlays all of the parametric data as well as the mathematical calculations that the actuaries have typically um, either, either not bothered with or have bothered with in a single spread spreadsheet. And bring that into a sense of being able to, to settle the diamond claim is something that we have been so excited about doing. Um, and we're, uh, you know, we're, we're very close to being able to, you know, take this out and showcase it in the diamond sense. Most of the smart contract work in insurance and in blockchain has really been looking at, hey, here's a weather event, or maybe the flight was late and you can have $200 in your pocket. You know, we're talking about settlement of claims that could be anywhere from a million dollars to $10 million, even to $100 million. And so the ability to be able to bring science to this and at a proof in time that these things did occur um, will make a huge difference to our industry. That's interesting. Uh, uh, but uh, so my, my, I was wondering then who are the nodes in the, um, on the Aris layer? So uh, are, are you talking about having nodes that are being controlled by every diamond cutter or by traders? Like, what, what is the interaction between all of these players in the supply chain and uh, with, with the technology itself? So building a ledger like we are in a platform, I think it's important just to not only consider nodes but to consider reputation. Mm. And when we think about nodes, you know, nodes for us are not only about a physical company um, that's been onboarded but actual machines. And are those machines trusted firstly as a machine that is accepted by industry and secondly are those machines calibrated so you know and at what point in time have they been calibrated to perfection and and so when we think about our world our world is not only about the the nodes of reputation of experts that have an opinion that can pass the opinion in co-signing at a certain point in time but it's also machine to machine and so we securely handshake with the machines that are on the pipeline and then recalibrate or not recalibrate that's a wrong word and ensure that the calibration is um you know is kept up to standard as well so when you think about nodes in, in you know in fairness to our industry we have very easily identifiable important points in the pipeline the first is government organizations so the governments themselves as diamonds are physically exported out of a country that's an authentication process that that occurs today and then of course on the importing into the country it checks that the export was indeed a correct transaction so we have government organizations and the second is diamond bourses so bourses of course aren't necessarily in it for the commercial gain they're in it for just like museums in the art sense you know they are there as a trusted node of industry exchanges themselves are physically um, exchanging houses of trade and then you have actual traders whether they be diamond dealers um, cutters polishers wholesalers um, and the very last mile is retailers and consumers. Now, retailers and consumers are not nodes on the platform at all. They're consumers of the provenance data. Okay. So they, they would have access to the platform via some, some APIs or some, well, some, some web interface that connects to your APIs. Yeah. So our industry, our, I mean, besides the consumers that don't need to be identified, everything else is identified by a KYC check, just as all of our other participants in industry are. So we have large existing trading houses that unless you are a diamond trader, unless you have, I mean, in the rough sense, unless you have a mining license, you just would not be able to participate. It's as simple as that. So you have okay. to be authenticated. And so touching on authentication, it's, it's an interesting point because uh, oftentimes uh, we forget that uh, if you're operating on some sort of a blockchain system, there, there, there needs to be um, an authority uh, in most cases uh, for public for permission blockchains uh, that provides identity. In, in this case, are, are, is, is Everledger then positioned sort of as a certificate authority that issues uh, keys to all the players in the system? Or are you relying on some in existing industry consortiums or you know, some in, 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 existing institutions to issue certificates and, and, and finally keys for people to participate in this permission network? So, I mean, we check back 
um, with the government organisations on mining licences. And so there are existing processes that are in place to identify uh, legitimised traders under licence. Um, but we physically issue the access to the Everledger platform um, currently. Um, whether that will change in the future, um, I would like to think that it would. I would like to think that the industry itself forms a consortium and that, that um, you know, that uh, just like we've seen with the KPC, the Kimberley certification process in the rough trading, that we have the similar thing. And, and I welcome that. You know, we're not necessarily about becoming a central authority of issuance. That's not our business model. We're bringing transparency and a technology to the industry and that the industry um, is, you know, is you know, they're highly vocal um, about being sure that the industry at large has a say in in where this goes and, and I open I open myself to that in a big way. So like one of the questions would be that the way I imagine it there's this there's this private blockchain that has the actual data, the actual providence data, and this data is maintained by a lot of different participants. Um, like as you mentioned players in the industry like bourses, exchanges, etc. So how, how does this data get, get monetized? Like uh, do the financial institutions that might need this data, do they pay for this data or what's the business model here? Yeah, so look in the in the space of insurance fraud, you know, there is existing layers that are very costly to a claim process. And, you know, the cost of processing a claim in the insurance world is around 16% of cost of claim. And if you have the ability to reduce that in such a way, um, then, of course, there's money to be spent. But shamelessly, you know, the industry has somewhat accepted fraud as just a cost of business. And when you start to think about the cost of fraud to the insurance industry, it's significantly high. So, you know, I spoke before about loss adjusters and their role in terms of either establishing quantum or the finality of settlement. And if we're able to reduce that cost, and I know that, you know, on average in a jewellery claim, it's around 75 Australian dollars. So it's about 30 pounds a claim. If we're able to reduce that or somewhat assist in the reduction of fraud, then you know that that's a paid that's a paid set of processes. So yes, access to data is a fee charging event, and secondly, so too is the um, the likelihood to find or return a lost or stolen item. So at the time an insurance claim is paid out, and this diamond ring has been paid by the insurance company, and this diamond is in circulation somewhere around the world, and it's on the ledger at a future state point in time and it comes back up onto the ledger, it's actually the rightful uh, object of the insurance company. And so if you think about diamonds, they're appreciable in value. So a claim for a five-carat diamond ring might be $70,000. If that was lost two years ago, I mean, that one claim or that one diamond could actually be worth at least another 10 or 15% more. So the insurance companies would want this back. It's an existing part of a process called repatriation. Um, you know, so there's that part of the process that we have driven based on success. So we will take a percentage of the value of the item that is rightfully returned to its owner and whether that owner be the insurance company um, or whether that owner be the claimant uh, if a claim is left open. In terms of financial institutions and banks, um, you know, it's around what is the, what's the, you know, what's the basis points that we can afford if we're reducing risk and in a $20 billion supply chain finance market, we think that that's a fairly healthy opportunity to be able to codify into smart contracts and provide some transparency around. If, if, if data itself is, is this thing of value that is being produced in the system, then doesn't the blockchain with its kind of decentralized architecture where this data is seen and owned by multiple players rather than a single player such as yourself, doesn't that architecture inhibit good monetization? Right, like suppose you had this all of this data on on sort of a centralized database, then you could be the only access point to this data. But with a blockchain, because this data is shared across so many nodes, doesn't that introduce uh, some form of competition where multiple nodes could actually supply that data and thus reduce the value of that data to Everledger itself? Yeah, you know, I think that, it, I mean, it can be answered as simply as saying that the sum of the whole is great is worth more than the sum of the parts. Um, so we haven't come across that inhibitor. In fact, if anything, 
the decentralized nature of the data as well as the ability to track the provenance of that data has actually opened up a shared revenue model that maybe our industry hasn't seen before and that until this point in time most of the siloed participants in industry have really selfishly kept the revenue to themselves so it actually forms out entirely new revenue models that the industry itself hadn't necessarily even begun to experience or enjoy and so i, I sort of see it in a very different light so yeah in, in essence like you're kind of stitching together all of these participants and building this common data structure and then selling this data and then distributing the rev revenue to all of these participants that contributed it right look our industry has seen an uh, 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 the GIA was formed um, to provide a certification benchmarking for standard and, you know, it's a not-for-profit profitable part of our entity and it's a siloed central authority um, that there is some richness of data that sits there in the history and longevity in terms of certification for probably about 70% of the world's diamonds. Now, to enable that as a baseline of records and to enable that to grow out entirely new financial services or services to market participants like banks and insurance companies or yet to be thought of um, industries like hedge funds and what have you um, is, an, is a truly exciting time. I, I, I said before, you know, we're not a disruptor. I mean, a lot of people talk about startups being disrupting. We are co-evolving the industry. We are literally turning ourselves into you know, marsupial animals that can, you know, that, uh, you know, that, 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 I mean, we're evolving. <laughs> well, then that's probably a good topic to uh, lead into sort of the final part of the episode before we wrap up is um, other industries. Uh, so diamonds are uh, obviously one industry where, we, you know, we, as we've seen uh, throughout the show, there's enormous value in pro providing provenance uh, throughout the supply chain. There's also quite a lot of, like quite a few other industries that are trying to tackle the same sort of um, problems that uh, that you're addressing with diamonds. Um, you know, one can think of you know luxury wine, for instance. Uh, I know here in France, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of people talk to me about you know provenance of alcohol uh, and specifically wines. Um, but other industries as well, like you know, there are things like uh, industries like the like the food industry, specifically fish, fishing uh, and fisheries, where uh, a lot of regulations are being applied uh, in order to uh, sort of uh, save. Uh, um, the fishing industry from you know collapsing under the overfisheries. Uh, another another interesting interesting um, idea is to provide um, uh, providence for electricity. So you know, if we think of the smart grid, uh, a lot of the thinking around smart grid has been you know, how do I efficiently uh, allow for local consumers and local producers to to trade energy credits? But really, what that comes down to, they they. they so the foundational idea is how do I trace electricity? How how can I make sure that this electricity that I'm that I'm buying is locally produced and therefore green and therefore you know of lower cost and 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 uh, of less impact on the on the um, uh, on the uh, on the environment? Um, so you know, given the fact that there are so many industries in which. Uh, uh, providence and applying traceability to the supply chain can be of enormous value. What are some of the other industries in which Everledger is uh, looking at as potential you know, markets to go into? So I guess there's two things that we're really purposed by. And the, and the first is that, you know, what the diamond industry did in the year 2000 and drove ethical supply chain with the Kimberley certification process has been largely successful and, and the industry should be applauded for the work that it did. And if you start to think about the disciplines and the protocols that have been put in place, these can be translated across into other, other layers of Mother's Earth's assets. Now, whether that be rubies or sapphires or even at, even more importantly, whether it's elephant tusks or, um, you know, snakeskins out of Colombia, I think that these are some of the most important parts of commodities that are being traded in the luxury goods space that should have an ethical backbone and we should have some stringent reporting and transparency around it. And we're completely empowered by that. So that is something that I fearlessly and daily will continue to chant like a crazy person and become involved with. So that's the first part. The second part is that, you know, there are other items within inside of the luxury goods space that have been exploited in terms of counterfeit 
and the ability to take the modules that we've built, which is really around blockchain and smart contracts and machine vision, um, you know, and really high level algorithms in terms of risk um, reduction or even counterfeit applicability, we can apply those into components of the luxury goods space. Um, and and that that's where we sit. So we, you know, firstly, we're emp empowered like a little bit of Mother Teresa on the blockchain. We really think that this stuff's important and we want to try and solve a problem that's not been able to be solved before today that actually is a global issue that needs and should be solved. And the second part is that, you know, we're in a space where we're extremely interested in appreciable items that could be recognised as a rising asset class that has some element or overview of fraud and risk and that can actually give birth to entirely new financial products and diamonds being the one to start with. But just as Amazon started with books, Everledger starts with diamonds and we know that the work that we're doing uh, already is in the art space. We made an investment in a company this year in February called Vastari and they work in um, putting art into museums for collectors around the world. Um, and secondly, our product comes to market on the 25th of November for fine wine. And we've come together with the largest name in industry. Her name is Maureen Downey. She is the Sherlock Holmes of wine when it comes to fraud, was involved in uh, Rudy, uh, who, of course, was one of the largest fraudsters in wine, in fine wine. And we've bought the same disciplines that we've created inside of the diamond industry with the digital thumbprint. We've enabled our technology to be applied into fine wine. And so that gets released into the market on the 25th of November with some of the larger names in industry here in London and in France. Uh, that's really interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat surprised and shocked that the Sherlock Holmes of uh, wine fraud is not French. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or British. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Leanne, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was, it's a really fascinating topic, one that I'm, I'm particularly very interested in. As uh, as you know, Stratum does the company that, that I co-founded uh, is is also uh, addressing a lot of these issues. Of work. So we're building more of the technology side, not so much the product side. Uh, but uh, yeah, traceability uh, on all types of different types of supply chains is is something that is very near and dear to me. So uh, it's it was very fascinating to talk to you today uh, about the work that you're doing with Everledger. Yeah, I appreciate the chance. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in. Uh, we are part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find lots of great shows about Bitcoin, blockchains, cryptocurrencies, decentralized technologies, etc. at letstalkbitcoin.com. You can find us at youtube.com slash epicenterbtc, or you can download the show on your favorite podcasting app. So we're available on iTunes, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.